Lord Reed, my lords, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome. My name is Pete Eckhart. I'm the dean of the faculty here at UCL. Very warm welcome to the 71st uh, annual Bentham Association Presidential Address. There's a dispute about whether it's the 71st or the 70th, but our secretary will in a minute talk about that. Uh, I think it's the first time that we have the presidential address back in our old Bentham House, which is no longer just our old Bentham House, but which is also our new Bentham House. And I'm sure many of you uh, have already been uh, in the building, but also probably some of you have not yet seen the refurbished Bentham House, and we're in the new part here. And we are, I absolutely love being here. It's a wonderful home for the faculty, for our students, for our staff, uh, and of course for our alumni. So it does give me very great pleasure to see you all here uh, in, in the new surroundings, and uh, I don't think there's much time for a tour tonight, but if any of you ever want to come back and want a sort of private tour, do let us know. Um, the Bentham Association is a, is a tremendous uh, uh, asset for, for the faculty, um, and we, um, we think the support of our alumni is absolutely incredible. I'll say a few more words at dinner about what we're doing with alumni and what we're doing as a faculty, I think, most of you are, are staying for dinner as well, and I don't want to eat into the, the time of our, our speaker. All that's left for me to do is to uh, introduce the uh, uh, secretary uh, of the Bentham Association, Nigel Fleming QC, who will introduce our speaker, Lord Reed, in his customary inspired manner, and will also try to, I think, involve uh, Mr. Jeremy Bentham. Uh, Nigel, over thank to you. you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yes. I think it's important to start all of these evenings by speaking to Mr. Bentham. So it's Mr. Bentham, alumni, my lord, ladies, and honoured guests. I have notes for a reason this time, because I wanted to remind myself of a quote from last year that you may not all have remembered. The first thing, it's, it's a bit odd, um, although nice to be in the building, to be in a lecture theatre where you're all on the same level, uh, whereas we've been for many years, as you know, in a, a, an old-fashioned lecture theatre where people can go to sleep at the top. And, and, and sitting down at the, at the front, seeing people nodding off is, is, is a kind of inspiration. <laughs> I think it's 70 years that we've been going because Lord Duparc, uh, Lord of Appeal in Ordinary, addressed the association in 1949. Our only uh, Jersey man, as far as I know, having gone through the list, I think it's our 70th birthday, but on your... Uh, last year, when it was Hazel speaking, we honoured her with it being the 70th birthday then, so it's the 71st <laughs> birthday today. Uh, before I introduce very briefly our president, uh, I regret, hence the need for the notes, uh, that, uh, and you will regret if you're regular attendees at these functions, uh, that I need to make another personal apology to Mr Bentham. We are all gathered together in his memory, uh, and Mr. Bentham, uh, UCL has again failed to arrange your physical attendance at our lecture. Last year, I expressed regret, and the words I used, that there had been an administrative hiccup, and also his, your temporary absence in America, but that's by the by. But that administrative hiccup had prevented ensuring your physical attendance at the 2018 presidential address. But I assured you, again in quotes, that in the spring of 2019, as we drift into the first transitional phase of Brexit, <laughs> we, will, we will try and do better. We have, one, failed to arrange your attendance, but two, we have continued to drift. As for your visit to America, Mr. Bentham, we look forward during the course of this year to your account of your meeting with another president, Donald J. Trump. I understand it was a meeting of minds. <laughs> Perhaps we can follow that up later. <laughs> However, there has been an improvement since last year. You will notice that we have cameras, Mr. Bentham, we have at least four cameras. You may not have had them when you were in your prime. And I'm told that a, a remote camera is in your uh, resting place uh, downstairs, across the road as we would call it. Uh, and you are hearing us reasonably clearly, uh, but the vision's a bit fuzzy. Uh, we have said that we will check up as we go for supper 
later. Uh, but Mr. Bentham, I hope you're paying attention because we have a treat in store. So apologies for the digression. Uh, if you come back next year, I will have probably another apology to make <laughs> to you, Mr. Bentham. It is very great, my very great pleasure to welcome on your behalf, Lord Reed, Deputy President of the Supreme Court to address us tonight. We also welcome Jane. Yes. yes. Jane. <coughs> Uh, Lord, Lady Reed as our guest. Uh, Lord Reed has been a Supreme Court judge since 2012 and has served as a judge for just over 20 years. His judgments uh, in the Supreme Court are a delight to read, even when on the losing side. <laughs> and if you have seen it as all keen lawyers that you are, today's judgment in the Jordan case, it's a fine example, it's a, a Northern Ireland case. It's a difficult topic and it's covered in a tight 41 paragraphs, and it is a, a lesson in how to write and deliver a judgment. So Lord Reed uh, finally has said that he would kindly listen to questions, I think is how he put it, uh, at the end of, of his address. <laughs> and as he is more used to asking questions for the last 20 years, he will then decide whether or not to answer them. <laughs> so uh, with that introduction, brief as it is, well, thank you very much. I'm greatly honoured to have been appointed as president of your association for this year and to have been invited to give this presidential address. It's a great pity that Mr Bentham himself is unable to join us. He might have found the subject of my talk of some interest as he was a vehement critic of the judicial role of the House of Lords. Recalling that the Roman Emperor Caligula had planned to appoint his favorite horse, Incitatus, as consul, Jeremy Bentham wrote in 1790 that it is beyond comparison better that a horse should have a voice in that house, that's to say the House of Lords, than that a judge should. Neighing in that house would not make a horse the worse for riding but sitting and voting in that house makes a judge very much the worse for judging. Writing 40 years later, Bentham was no more impressed by the judicial role of the House of Lords, describing it as a complete mockery of justice. His principal objection was that the judges who sat in the House of Lords at that time also served in the courts below and appear, from what he says, to have had no compunction about participating in appeals against their own decisions. <laughs> he was also, well, in fact, there's a, there's a famous judgment where a Scottish judge does this, and he says, um, I, I was utterly convinced of this point when I sat at first instance, and now I've heard the appeal, I'm even more convinced. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Bentham was also critical of the practice of lay peers taking part in the consideration of appeals despite their being, in his words, ignorant of the law and destitute of judicial aptitude by indolence and carelessness. <coughs> Those problems disappeared later in the 19th century, first with the ending of lay participation in appeals, and then with the appointment of professional judges as salaried peers, specifically in order to hear the appeals. But Bentham would, I think, have agreed with those who considered that there remained uh, a more fundamental objection to the highest court in the land being constituted as a committee of the legislature, uh, an objection based on the separation of powers. As we all know, the government eventually decided to establish a Supreme Court in place of the appellate committee of the House of Lords. The necessary legislation was enacted in the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, and the Supreme Court opened its doors on the 1st of October 2009. I think we can safely say that Mr. Bentham would have been delighted. Taking stock 10 years later, what advantages, if any, have actually resulted from the highest court's separation from Parliament? Have there been any disadvantages? If so, what is the balance of advantages and disadvantages? Has the creation of the Supreme Court made any difference to the outcome of the cases that are heard? <coughs> Has it made any other differences to the way in which the highest court operates? Those are the questions that I'm going to discuss. I do so, of course, from the perspective of a member of the court who has served on it under all of its presidents to date. 
but I should make it clear that I'm expressing a purely personal view. Well, to begin, it's only if we have an idea of the function of a Supreme Court that we can decide how well, that it's, how well it's performing them. So it's worth beginning by asking why do we have a Supreme Court at all or the appellate committee before it? After all, the Supreme Court of Judicature Act of 1873 enacted that there would be no further appeal from the Court of Appeal, but it was never brought into force. And in Scotland, criminal appeals have never proceeded beyond the Scottish courts, unless, uh, under recent legislation, there is a devolution issue raised or an issue of compatibility with convention rights. As I see it, the Supreme Court has three principal functions. The first arises from the fact that the intermediate appeal courts have to deal quickly and efficiently with thousands of cases each year. The great majority concern errors in the application of established law, either a failure by lower courts and tribunals to understand the established principles correctly or a failure to apply them correctly to the facts. The appeal courts dispose of them by sitting in panels of two or three <coughs> and allocating the judgment writing between the members of the panel in advance of the hearing. The result is that each member of the panel focuses particularly on the cases which have been allocated to him or her, usually on the basis of their experience and expertise. The Supreme Court operates very differently. Like the House of Lords before it, it grants permission to appeal in only a tiny fraction of the cases heard by the Court of Appeal and its equivalents in Scotland and Northern Ireland, around 75 cases a year, which adheres along with another 40 or 50 in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. The numbers are so low because it's not the Court's function to correct errors in the application of established principles. That would simply involve a different set of judges repeating the exercise already undertaken by the Court of Appeal. Instead, although we have to adopt a different approach for questions of EU law are raised because of our duty to refer those questions to the European Court of Justice for the answer has not already been made clear, as a general rule, the Supreme Court grants permission to appeal only where the appeal raises an arguable question of law of general public importance, which the court ought to consider at that time. That criterion enables us to hear a small number of cases raising important issues of principle, and because there are only a limited number of them at any one time, we can devote greater resources to them than an intermediate court of appeal can afford. The way we deal with them also reflects the fact that, unlike the court of appeal, we are not bound by precedent. And so an important aspect of our role is the development of the law through our consideration of the cases raising the most important questions. The performance of that function requires a sense of the coherence of the law as a whole, an awareness of how it has developed over time, and an understanding of how it needs to develop now so as to respond to the evolving needs of present-day society. In order to meet those requirements, we have larger panels than in the lower court, at least five justices, and sometimes seven or more. That larger panel also tends to even out the differences in judicial outlook and temperament, which can be more significant on a smaller court. The panels are also constituted so as to ensure that there's a breadth of experience represented from across the law as a whole. As another matter of deliberate policy, Judgment writing is not allocated in advance, so every member of a panel prepares every case with more or less equal thoroughness <coughs> and is expected to be equally engaged, whatever their previous experience may have been. So put shortly, the first function of the Supreme Court is to enable important questions of law to be considered with a degree of depth, time, <coughs> combined intelligence and breadth of legal experience which the intermediate courts of appeal can't normally be expected to devote to them. Our aim is to ensure, as far as we can, that the law is clear, principled, and suitable for our times. Secondly, the Supreme Court is the only court for the United Kingdom as a whole, apart from a few tribunals. As the highest court for all three jurisdictions, the Supreme Court is the only court which can ensure that a 
consistent approach is followed in areas of the law which are identical across the UK, for example, immigration and asylum, extradition, most aspects of taxation and social security, and also in other areas which are largely common across the different legal systems, such as much of the law of contract, negligence, company law, and corporate insolvency. Thirdly, the Supreme Court has a statutory jurisdiction to determine references made to it in relation to the validity of devolved legislation, usually as a result of disputes between the UK government and one of the devolved governments. It's also the final court of appeal in relation to other devolution issues, questions of EU law, questions of human rights, and other questions of a constitutional character. This makes it effectively the Constitutional Court of the United Kingdom. So, the three functions that I've identified are first, the consideration of the most important questions of law and the development of the law. Secondly, ensuring the coherence of the law which is shared by the UK as a whole. And thirdly, acting as the UK's Constitutional Court. How has the establishment of the Supreme Court affected the way in which those functions are performed? The most significant impact, in my view, has been on the court's function, function as a constitutional court. That's the area where the House of Lords' embeddedness in Parliament caused the greatest difficulty. The UK's membership of the EU and the enactment of the Human Rights Act have meant that the legislation enacted by Parliament can be challenged in the courts. Where such challenges are successful, the result can potentially place the Supreme Court in opposition to the views of Parliament, a situation which requires mutual respect and understanding between Parliament and the Supreme Court. But it's preferable to the situation which existed before the Supreme Court was established, when the law lords had to decide the lawfulness and compatibility with human rights of legislation enacted by a legislature of which they were themselves members, albeit in recent times not active participants. That's not the only respect in which it had become apparent even before 2009 that the constitutional role of the highest court was difficult to <coughs> reconcile with the intrinsic connections between the House of Lords as a judicial body and the House of Lords as a political body. That difficulty emerged particularly clearly when under the legislation of 1998 establishing devolution, the function of deciding disputes over the powers of the devolved governments and legislatures was given not to the House of Lords, but to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the JCPC. But even that was not an entirely satisfactory solution. Until the establishment of the Supreme Court, the JCPC sat in the Privy Council chamber at number 9 Downing Street. Can you imagine how it would look to the general public in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland if legal disputes between the devolved governments and the UK government, such as last year's litigation over the question whether the Scottish Parliament had the power to pass legislation addressing the consequences of Brexit, if those issues were decided in Downing Street. The problems inherent in having a constitutional court situated within Parliament have become even more obvious since the referendum on EU membership and the subsequent litigation over the powers of Parliament in relation to Brexit. How would it have looked to ordinary members of the public if the Gina Miller case, which turned on where the boundary lay between the powers of the government and the powers of Parliament, had been heard in a committee room in the Palace of Westminster with judgment handed down in the chamber of the House of Lords? In cases of that character, there is a problem in having a final court of appeal which forms part of Parliament, if justice is not only to be done, but to be seen to be done. Ten years on from the opening of the Supreme Court, its experience of EU and human rights cases, of devolution cases, and of other constitutional cases, such as Miller, has demonstrated the wisdom of those who decided that the constitutional function of the UK's highest court called for the establishment of a new and independent body. Are there any other respects in which the Supreme Court is better able to perform its functions than the House of Lords? Well, as I never served as a law lord, I would defer to the views of those with experience of both tribunals. 
but I would draw attention to a number of consequences of the move which have, I think, assisted us in the way we do our work. The appellate committee, although functionally a court, was formerly a parliamentary committee. That brought a number of advantages which the Supreme Court has sought to preserve. So, for example, the room in which the committee sat didn't have the appearance of a traditional courtroom. As they were sitting as members of a parliamentary committee, the law lords did not wear robes. They didn't sit at a raised bench, but at a table at the same level as council, only a few feet away. The table was crescent-shaped, as in other committee rooms, so that the members of the committee could see each other. As a committee of the House of the Lords, they had to report back to the House in order for their decisions to be given effect. One way they could do that, used only occasionally, was to prepare a joint report, which was then laid before the House and <coughs> voted upon, the members of the committee being the only members to take part in the vote. The other way, which was almost always used, was for each member of the committee to prepare a speech. That's why it's a solecism to refer to the judgment of a member of the House of Lords. They had to be speeches, because that's how a member of the House conveys his views to its other members. And each member of the committee had to deliver his own speech. There couldn't be joint speeches, since members of the House have to speak one at a time. I understand from former law lords that the members of the committee worked on their speeches largely independently of one another and circulated their drafts in hard copy. The degree to which they commented on each other's draft speeches and responded to comments on their own draft appears to have been relatively limited. The fact that members of the committee did not have their offices located together or their own separate dining facilities may have affected the degree of collegiality. Space was generally very limited, and the number of judicial assistants was correspondingly restricted. When the law lords, or at least most of them, became justices of the Supreme Court, they brought some of their old practices with them, but left others behind. The justices, of course, are judges, not members of a parliamentary committee. So we do sit in courtrooms. But we continue to wear ordinary clothes. We continue to sit at a table at the same level as council, only a few feet away. The table remains crescent-shaped so that we can easily communicate. We continue to start hearings at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning rather than the 10.30 start adopted on the other days of the week, a practice whose original purpose was to allow the peers time to return to town from their country estates. <laughs> Those were the days. But nowadays, allow us time for meetings and paperwork. But in other respects, the establishment of the Supreme Court cleared the way for a reform of the way in which business was conducted, free from the historical traditions of the House of Lords. First, since the justices are judges, they prepare judgments, not speeches. That change has made it possible for there to be joint judgments or single judgments of the court. Single judgments or at least a single majority judgment, are favoured where possible, so that the reasoning of the majority is expressed in a single text so as to assist lower courts and legal practitioners. Concurring judgments may be unavoidable where judges arrive at the same conclusion uh, by different processes of reasoning, but care is taken that the differences in reasoning are made plain and don't lead to obscurity or argument about what the court has decided. There is a danger that judges repeat each other's reasoning with unintended subtle distinctions on which academics and the legal profession then fasten with unfortunate consequences for legal certainty. Ensuring that that doesn't happen is one of the responsibilities of the presiding justice. On the other hand, having a number of fully reasoned judgments is encouraged on occasions when the court is uncertain how the law should develop and wants to encourage a discussion amongst academics and other judges. In practice, it has also become increasingly common in recent years for justices to produce joint judgments. This can be a good solution where more than one justice would like to write. I have to say, as a presiding justice myself, that the most serious problem is that everybody wants to write almost every case, and you have to... Um, uh, a good compromise can sometimes be getting people to write a joint judgment together. 
It's a particularly uh, good idea where the case raises a number of issues which the justices can divide between them. Uh, indeed, in complex cases where a judgment has to be produced quickly, joint judgments can be a, a, a viable way of dividing up the work. Secondly, the Supreme Court has embraced the use of new technology. So justices draft their judgments as Word documents, and the draft judgments are circulated by email. Comments are circulated in the same way. Because the justices can access the judgments and emails wherever they are in the world, <coughs> there are frequent conversations about the draft judgments and a lively exchange of ideas. So the exchanges about a draft judgment prompt the preparation of a revised draft, which is then circulated, prompting further discussion and further revision. And so the preparation of a judgment becomes an iterative process to which other justices, besides the author, will usually make a significant contribution. This means that the use of single or uh, joint judgments is not as limiting as might be thought. The single judgment in reality is a product of a highly collaborative process in which all the members of the panel are active participants. I would hope that bringing at least five intelligences actively to bear will result in better judgments than most of us would prepare if we were working in isolation. Thirdly, the Supreme Court building itself assists in this collaborative process. The justices' offices are next to one another. We each have a reasonably spacious room with a number of armchairs where colleagues can drop in to discuss matters. Most of us work with our doors open, encouraging that to happen. We normally have lunch together every day that we're sitting, encouraging collegiality. We have conference rooms where we meet to discuss cases after the hearing. <laughs> it may seem a simple matter, but it didn't exist in the House of Lords. We usually have a brief discussion of the case in the presiding justice's room 15 minutes before the hearing, focusing particularly on how the hearing should be conducted. Any views expressed at that stage are usually tentative. Further discussions take place after each adjournment, and a longer discussion is usually held immediately after the hearing is finished. Sometimes, if we require more time to consider the case before we express a view, we agree to meet a week or two after the hearing. We also sometimes have further meetings if agreeing a judgment is proving difficult. The discussions at the post-hearing meeting can be lengthy, um, not infrequently an hour or two, and quite robust. But I haven't yet had to deal with a situation reported to have occurred during the discussion of a case before the Wisconsin Supreme Court, where one member of a court was accused of choking another during their deliberations. <laughs> He admitted putting his, neck, putting his hands on his colleague's neck, but said <coughs> that he'd been acting defensively. <laughs> the flexibility that we now enjoy would have been more difficult to achieve in the House of Lords because of the limited availability of accommodation. There were no meetings before the hearings, and at the end of the hearing, the clerk called out, clear the bar, and counsel and their solicitors quickly gathered up the books and papers and left the room, leaving the committee to its deliberations. After the leading draft judgment was circulated, there might be the odd informal discussion between two or three law lords, but very rarely <coughs> any meeting of all five. Turning to another subject, one of the most important effects of setting up the Supreme Court has been to make the court much more accessible to the public. Although the public were allowed access to Committee Room 1 of the House of Lords, getting there required the navigation of a maze of corridors in the furthest reaches of the Palace of Westminster. It's much easier to step into the current building. Some 80 or 90,000 people do so every year, including a great many school children and students. We have a front of house team who organise visits and put on open days and other events to encourage members of the public to visit the court and learn about what it does. We also hold events for schools and universities after court hours. And for schools which are too far away to visit, we have a scheme under which pupils can have a discussion with a justice via a video link. Those sorts of activities were not possible in the House of Lords. There's another aspect of the Supreme Court which would have appealed to Mr Bentham. In the work of 1790, which I quoted previously, he wrote... Publicity is the very soul of justice. It is the keenest spur to exertion, 
and the surest of all guards against improbity. It keeps the judge himself while trying under trial. I would add that publicity is not only important as a safeguard against impropriety. If you ask why the public accept decisions made by the judiciary, the answer, I would suggest, rests in confidence or trust. The greatest challenge of judging is perhaps to ensure that all segments of the community have confidence that the administration of justice is independent and impartial. One of the challenges the judiciary constantly face is to maintain that confidence, especially when they have to deal with cases involving issues on which public opinion is sharply divided. It's easy for people who don't understand what judges do to assume that they simply apply their own political views, a misunderstanding which appears on some occasions to have been shared by sections of the media. A notorious example was the Gina Miller case, when the High Court's decision came as an unwelcome surprise to a section of the media and was reported in one of the newspapers with photographs of the judges under the headline, Enemies of the People. The appeal to the Supreme Court was preceded by analyses in the media of how pro-EU every member of the court was thought to be, based on our backgrounds and on social media (coughs) postings by members of our families. In the event, the predictions uh, of which way we were each likely to decide the case proved to be hopelessly wrong. The media's difficulty was not that they didn't have enough information about our political views. Even if our political views had been identified with complete accuracy, the media would still have got their predictions wrong. What they hadn't understood was that the fact that a judgment has political implications does not mean that the judges are deciding a political question. They're deciding a legal question, in that case about the effect of the European Communities Act, and they decide legal questions by applying their legal expertise. I've mentioned the work of our front of house team. We also have a communications team. Through them, we have an active involvement in social media. Although we scarcely register as a social media presence (coughs) compared with, um, for example, Kim Kardashian, (laughs) nevertheless, we have a substantial number of loyal followers. Our communications team maintain relationships with bloggers who cover our work, recognising the importance of their role in the media landscape. We also engage with the traditional media to a greater extent than the House of Lords did, recognising that the court operates in an intensive media environment where journalists are under pressure to provide an instant response to our judgments. So our communications team maintain relationships with the journalists who cover the Supreme Court, keeping them informed of newsworthy decisions uh, and assisting them with briefings in appropriate cases. This has had a significant impact on reporting of the court's work, which is more frequent and I think better informed on the whole than it was in the days of the appellate committee. They also follow up the media coverage and will occasionally point out factual errors, so that, for example, a mistake on the BBC website uh, after we've handed down a judgment is corrected before the item makes the lunchtime news. And they also organise interviews of justices from time to time by different media outlets. However, what probably has made the greatest uh, impact on the general public is the fact that we live stream our hearings. We are the only court in the UK to do so, and as far as I know, the only common law Supreme Court in the world. Videos of previous hearings are also available on the website. We also live stream the delivery of our judgments when the justice who's written the lead judgment gives a short explanation of the decision in ordinary language. Footage from our proceedings is then used by the media on television uh, and on newspaper websites. The importance of filming our proceedings was illustrated when the Miller appeal reached us. The hearing in our court uh, was live streamed on our website and a number of media organisations also live streamed the proceedings on their own websites. The number of people watching was over 300,000 and in addition to those a much greater number saw highlights on television news. There were even some late-night programmes devoted to the case where pundits commented on the footage. The result was that a significant element of the public saw that what was being discussed was an issue of constitutional law. It was dry and technical, but the important point was that it was different from the political debate over Brexit. The media also worked out from our questioning of counsel how the decision looked likely to go. 
The result was that when our decision was issued, there was no sense of shock, uh, no concern that the court might be interfering in politics, but an acceptance that that was how the court understood the law. The case, I think, illustrates how an intelligent approach to communication, making use of the possibilities offered by modern media, can help to promote public understanding of our work. The discussion of accessibility and communication also illustrates how the establishment of the Supreme Court provided an opportunity to reflect on how a modern apex court should operate and to put those arrangements into place. Another illustration is the development and the role of judicial assistants. There were judicial assistants in the House of Lords, but they were few in number, and not every law lord had one. It wasn't easy to find accommodation for them, and it tended to be in out-of-the-way places. In the Supreme Court, we currently have eight judicial assistants. Uh, the four senior justices have one each, and the other justices one between two. Later this year, we'll be expanding the number of JAs so that the justices will have one each. They share an office so that they can work collaboratively. Uh, it's close to the justices' rooms. They carry out the search for the justices and assist us with preparation of lectures, and some justices also allow them to play a part in the preparation of judgments. Not drafting them, but proofreading and providing comments on, for example, their clarity and coherence. They also play a very important role in the court's approach to accessibility and communications. It's they who draft the explanatory material given to visitors and who draft the press summaries which appear on our website. It's they also who deal with inquiries about our work from foreign courts and provide the responses <coughs> to European networks for sharing legal information. That brings me to the subject of a court's relationship with other courts, both overseas and in the UK. With its many meeting rooms, the establishment of the Supreme Court has greatly facilitated exchanges with the judiciary of Luxembourg, Strasbourg and national courts around the world. It's made it possible to welcome visiting judges from the states and territories which use the JCPC and from elsewhere in the UK. It's also helpful in maintaining good relations with the English and Welsh, Scottish and Northern Irish judiciary that we can appoint acting judges to sit with us, as a number of senior judges from all of those jurisdictions have done from time to time. That couldn't have happened in the House of Lords unless the judges happened to be peers. Another innovation has been particularly important. As I explained earlier, we're a UK court, but we're based in London, and the nature of things is most convenient, the court's most conveniently visited by people with easy access to London. We provide access to people in the rest of the UK through the internet, um, and justices also make frequent visits to um, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. Nevertheless, the physical presence of a court in a community and the ability of members of the community to attend the court remains important. With that in mind, we sat in Edinburgh in 2017 and Belfast in 2018. This year, we'll be sitting in Cardiff. Travelling to other parts of the UK has now become an established part of the court's calendar. So the establishment of the Supreme Court has addressed what would otherwise have been a growing problem in connection with the constitutional role of a final court, as long as it remained in Parliament. It has resulted in a number of changes for the better in the internal workings of the court. It's been a catalyst for changes in relation to public accessibility and communications. And it's encouraged the final court to do more to be recognised as a court for the UK as a whole. Has it made any difference to the outcome of appeals? Before the Supreme Court began work, Fears were expressed that the justices would behave as if we were sitting in the US Supreme Court, thinking themselves above Parliament and behaving in what critics would call a more activist manner. Have those fears turned out to be well-founded? I don't think there was ever any rational basis for thinking that a new home and a new name would affect the way in which senior judges behaved, and the apprehension has not turned out to be well-founded. However, there is what might be called a branding issue about the words Supreme Court, because they do bring the American court to mind. So it's important to make clear to the media and the public that the two courts uh, are very different. Some critics, however, would argue that in a number of our decisions, mostly taken under the Human Rights Act, the Supreme Court has involved itself in political questions concerning, for example, the criminalization of assisted suicide or the impact of a cap on social security benefits or abortion law in Northern Ireland. 
My answer would be that to the extent that the judges have involved themselves in questions of that kind, it's because they've been turned into legal questions as a result of legislation enacted by Parliament. That's not a consequence of the establishment of the Supreme Court. EU law and the Human Rights Act have enabled individuals and companies to challenge legislation and administrative decisions on a range of grounds which did not previously exist. And it's the duty of the courts to decide those cases when they come before them. The fact that the context of the, le the, context of the legal question may be an assessment of social or economic policy is reflected in the wide margin of appreciation allowed to political institutions by the legal criteria which we have to apply, such as the manifestly without reasonable foundation test under the ECHR. In fact, our approach to cases of that kind has also been criticised as excessively deferential towards the assessments made by the government and parliament. The challenge to the law on assisted suicide was rejected, and we recently refused permission for a second challenge to be brought before us. The challenge to the benefit cap was also rejected on the basis that the government's assessment of proportionality was not manifestly without a reasonable foundation. And the challenge to abortion law in Northern Ireland was likewise rejected because the body which brought the proceedings was held not to have standing to bring them. It also has to be said that there's nothing new about judges having to decide cases whose implications may be politically sensitive and sometimes doing so in a way that may be inconvenient to the government. I suspect that the government of the day was more dismayed by the case of Entican Carrington in Mr Bentham's time than present-day Whitehall has been by the decisions of the Supreme Court. Have there then been any disadvantages resulting from the moves across Parliament Square? I'd mentioned two. Um, the first, not so far a serious problem, concerns the Court's finances. Whereas the Appellate Committee was part of Parliament, the Supreme Court is a non-ministerial department. We're administratively independent of government and ministers, but we have to negotiate our budget with the Treasury under arrangements set out in an agreed concordat. Over the past decade, the Court has had to endure the same austerity as the rest of the public sector. For example, our last annual report reported that during the year we had hosted international judicial visits from India, Brazil and Albania, incurring costs in the region of I wonder if any of you would guess the costs of hosting these three judicial visits in the region of £138. <laughs> I can't help thinking of a Scottish phrase used entirely unfairly to caricature the supposed miserliness of Edinburgh people like myself. You'll have had your tea. <laughs> the second disadvantage concerns the loss of daily contact between the country's most senior judges and its politicians. The departure of the law lords from Parliament is only one of a number of developments which have weakened the links between judges and politicians. Those links, uh, to my mind, were valuable in nurturing mutual understanding. To make up for their loss, other steps have had to be taken to ensure that the government and Parliament understand and respect the role of the courts and indeed vice versa. With that in mind, the Supreme Court engages with Parliament <coughs> through meetings with parliamentarians and officers of Parliament and through appearances before parliamentary committees, of which I, I hope each side can get to understand better the role of the other and the problems that they face. In conclusion, I'd say that the creation of the Supreme Court has led to a significant change, both in the UK and overseas, in the image of British justice. It has become a visible and accessible <coughs> focal point and a symbol of the judicial system in the UK. As such, I think that it helps to promote confidence in the common law and its values. Perhaps above all, by comparison with the Judicial House of Lords, it has become much more evidently a court for the whole of the UK, visibly and accessibly serving its citizens. These, I think, are all developments which would have been warmly welcomed by Mr Bentham. Thank you. As I said at the outset, we have a, a few minutes for questions, if you have any, uh, and uh, Lord Reid may or may not answer. Any, any questions? Um, one, one question. Uh, you refer to how few cases are heard in the Supreme Court, and obviously a lot more cases uh, the advocates wish to be heard in the Supreme Court. How do you decide amongst yourselves 
whether to hear those mm -hmm. cases. We, we, statistically, we grant permission in one in three. We get about 250 applications a year and grant 75 to 80. Um, the, we, what happens is we have um, panels of three justices who will each consider around perhaps eight applications a month. And um, the convention is that if any one of the three thinks that the case meets our criterion, then normally we will um, grant permission. Um, we, um, Lady Hell and I uh, have to approve the, the, the panels for, the, for, the, for these applications, just like the panels for the hearings, are prepared by our registry and then have to be approved by the president and the deputy president. And um, we, again, try to have a, uh, a mix of people, people with different backgrounds looking at each one and as I say if, if anybody thinks that there really is a point we ought to be hearing then the norm is to grant permission. I wonder whether it was maybe the president who gets to make all the choices but... No, no it's not. No, it's no, really no, is no, 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 not at all. No. No. Yes? Um, in, in an area, in, in, a, in a time when specialisation is becoming more of just a sheer amount of yeah. law, uh, it, it is growing uh, are 12 enough people to cover the relevant range of expertise now, do you think? Mm. <coughs> don't have to answer. No, 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 it, it's, it's a good question. Um, we do, I think we manage. What we, what we, and for example, today I was hearing a tax case, and we had on the panel um, two... Scottish judges who have both done a lot of tax. One's a former revenue junior and a, chancery, a former Chancery Division judge. Um, the other two, no, two Chancery Division judges, and we had one family division judge. So we had really one person with a breadth of experience. Um, the two Scottish judges also have a breadth of experience because they're not as specialised as the English. But amongst the English, we... Um, we, so, so of the five judges, there, was, there was, wasn't really anybody who was a tax specialist. There were, but a number, we all knew enough about it to be able to, to do the appeal. Um, what we're trying to avoid is that the law becomes um, a sort of archipelago of islands of expertise. And there are areas, for example, planning law, say, and immigration law are both branches of administrative law. And the same general principles ought to be applying in both those areas when you're judicially reviewing decisions. But in reality, in practice, planning lawyers are a completely different breed from uh, immigration lawyers. They, they, they don't operate from the same chambers. They don't, they don't know each other. And you, you can have a culture where things are a sort of accepted way of doing things. And part of our and, and the, that doesn't really get broken up terribly much by the Court of Appeal because they also allocate things on the basis of expertise. And so we try to um, ensure in a situation like that that there's a coherent approach being applied. If there's a sensible doctrine of administrative law that's grown up in immigration cases, then we'll want to know why on earth not, why, why don't we apply that in a planning context. Or in commercial, in commercial law is basically contract. Um, and if there's a contractual doctrine that applies in one area of contract, again, well, why shouldn't it apply in insurance or shipping? Even if insurance lawyers and shipping lawyers tend to regard themselves as, as a bit of a breed apart. So that's part of our function, I think. One more question? Um, in, in the world where you explain the administration, so so in so much detail, it's fascinating to see behind it. But you've talked about moving from a paper-based system mm -hmm. in the House of Lords to a digital system. Yeah. Now, we haven't seen an example of a judge's briefcase being left on a, on a, on a train. We haven't seen an example of a hack if, yeah. of, of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But it is clearly an ever-present risk. Yeah. How would you deal with something like that in the administration of justice if in an early form judgment was released through cyber, a cyber breach? You don't need to answer that. Yes. 
we, we do have um, risk strategies, and that's one of our that's one of the major risks highlighted in our strategy. Um, so it's been thought about. <laughs> <laughs> But I can tell you, for, for example, we, we have a practice, as uh, Nigel will know, of letting council see our judgments a week before they're handed down. So that if there are any um, factual errors, for example, they can point them out, or if they feel they've not been fairly treated, if, for example, we refer to an authority that wasn't cited by council, they can, they can complain about it. It's done on an embargoed basis. We had a breach of that embargo last week um, for the first time, uh, I think, in a case to do with, um, it was an appeal against a criminal conviction by the Prime Minister of Mauritius. And um, because of the, we've investigated the, the breach, but because that breach has happened, we've now decided to impose sanctions on, effect effectively, to, to, stop, uh, to stop this practice in relation to Mauritius. Um, yeah, so until they can demonstrate that they can be trusted. Um, so, we, you know, we, we, hackers are a different, are, are a different mm -hmm. issue, but um, we, are a, we are aware of the confidentiality of what we deal with, and we, um, we, we take a great deal of care over it. Well, well thank you, Laurie, for a superb um, presidential address. As you, you may have noticed, I've had my phone on, and uh, Mr. Bentham has sent a message. <laughs> via our very small WhatsApp group, and <laughs> he expresses his appreciation particularly for mentioning Mistress Kardashian. <laughs> uh, he is forever grateful for being reminded of, of life. I hope you and uh, Lady Reed will enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much for joining us.